I'm overdue on some maintenance. My bison horn is worn down pretty badly here. All the little hair fibers that make up the horn are peeled back. Those are absorbing my percussion when I hit it, as well as just being in the way and being a general nuisance. I try not to let it get this bad, but obviously I've neglected it for far too long. So we're just going to do a little maintenance here today, trim this up, and see if we can get it back in service. This is my favorite tool. I've had it for many years. Probably worn about a half inch off the end, and there's usually about an inch and a half, two inches maybe, of use you can get out of the tip. So there's plenty more to go if we just take care of it a little bit better. A little bit of a sanding and a little bit of a light filing and it's good as new back in service. So I did a bad thing to my ivory, ivory warthog tusk here. I really pushed it on some basalt and blew the side off. And then the tip and the, or the top I should say, and the bottom are always a little prone to blow out. If you get too close to the top, they'll of course blow right off the top if you're hitting something really hard. And if you get to the bottom, surprisingly you kind of chisel the bottom of it off. So I like to bevel in all the edges typically as best I can to prevent that. And obviously you have to do quite a bit on this one side. So we'll just bevel these in and refresh it. Be a little smarter about it next time. I mean, you can always get more warthog tusk, right? Why should we take too much care of with it? But After it's all kind of fixed up and beveled back in, I like to score just a little line across it. It gives me just a nice little spot to grab some platforms where I need. It's not always needed. I often will use the, the blunt tip of this more than the little scoring line, but it's nice to have it there when you need it. Also kind of gives me a lower bounds, keeps me from getting down there on the bottom and splitting that out as much. Here in the Rockies they have a kind of moose they call a Shiris moose. Uh, they're a little bit smaller, they have quite a bit less palm, longer tines on them as a result. It's debatable, or debated I should say, as whether they're a real subspecies of a moose or just you know, kind of an undernourished regular moose, I, I don't know. Uh, but I like them because they're readily available in my area and they have these nice long tines on them. This one's an older one, I've taken a few tools off of it already. It's a chalk as they would call it, a few cracks in it. But if you're in the market for a moose horn, uh, I would still take a look at these chalked horns. Moose is very tight, even on the internal, it's not quite as pithy. Uh, and it's still very usable on the internals and since it holds together so tightly like that the chalk uh, really has to be pretty old in order to get in there and weaken the material quite a bit so as you're looking around in the classifieds looking for a moose horn don't be afraid to take a look at these chalked ones and see if they'll be usable for flint napping the dog chew guys don't like them because nobody wants a crusty old flaky moose antler being chewed up by their dog but they're great for tools now this other one it's a fresh pickup from this year and it's got a nice curve. I don't know what they call the points on a, a moose, but this would be like an eye guard or a G1 if it was an elk kind of a thing. It's got the same kind of curve as my bison horn, so I think I'm going to take it off and experiment with it this year and see if we can make a clincher style type of tool like my bison horn and my warthog tusk. I call them clincher because you kind of clinch them between your legs there to do the work. Anticipate this tool will probably be more of a, 
lower angle when you need to drive the force into the piece. The bison horn kind of does do double duty. It can be both a pulling, um, you know, pull the flakes off of the piece, or it can drive force into the piece, either way you want to use it. The warthog tusk is almost exclusively a, a peeling or pulling force, but I think this, because of just how tough the moose antler is, will be more of a driving type of tool. But We'll see. I'm excited to, to play with it this year. It's, a, it's been a little awkward for me to get started with it, as you'll see you later in the video, but I'm excited about it. Okay, back to our chalk antler. I need a new pressure flaker. My old one's getting a little short in my hand. I need to replace it, but I'm also going to try to take a percussor tool out of the base here. Start with the pressure flaker first. Definitely going to be long enough, so we'll take it right off and just make a quick, quick pressure flaker out of this. Pretty straightforward. I like the new length. So I'm not quite done with my old pressure flaker just yet. I'm going to try to convert it into a horizontal punch, horizontal shaft punch. This is a technique developed by Marty Reuter. If you haven't been over to Flint Napping Tips channel, go over there and learn how to do this properly. Uh, it's something that I learned for indirect percussion and it was a game changer for me. So I de desperately need a moose version of this. I'm just going to use a hardware dowel. I like one that gets a long straight grain end to end. This is about three foot and about three eighths inch diameter. It's a red oak. I wouldn't get any of the others. The red oak has two things going for it. When you have a straight grain, it has a nice flex to it and it's very durable. I use them for arrow shafts too, if, if I can find them. You gotta pick through quite a few of them sometimes to find the straight grain. That's kind of the key, I think. Now Marty uh, in the past has said not to use a dowel. So I'm definitely, definitely doing it wrong. Uh, it would be nice to convert to a stick, but and this is what I have right now. It's winter time. I'm lazy. So we're going with this. And I'm look, very much looking forward to having a moose antler version of this. I, I don't know why I haven't built one sooner. Good to go. I've spent a good portion of this last year trying to get better with my direct percussion. I'm going to try a little different approach with my soft hand this year. I'm going to take the end of this uh, antler off and see if I can't grind it down, take all these little spiky nubs around the button off. And I just want to kind of flatten them out. I'm not going to make a big rounded end here. I just want to flatten them off, give them a slight bevel to the center once they're, they're taken down and pretty flat around the outside. And then flatten off the tip. I think this will give me a pretty good chance at doing some good soft hammer work. It's fairly hefty. It's got some good meat to it. So kind of excited about it. Should be able to use it as an indirect uh, percussor as well. Time to bring them all together and do a little bit of a test run. Got this chunk of Brown's Bench Obsidian. Those things are like golf balls to crack into. Whatever moved them, glacier forces or whatever, just kind of pitted them all and they're tough. But once you're in it, it's, it's wonderful material. Uh, it's really, really awkward for me to kind of hold this like a pencil or in some type of hold like that that I can drive any flakes with, with any accuracy anyway, <laughs> as you can see. I swing and miss regularly, even still, even though it's a couple of weeks since I shot this video, but it's all the same principle. I just need to be able to start hitting platforms. So I tuck my wrist into my leg and try to hold it still and bring the hammer to the platform or whatever I hit. Over on Edbo's channel, he's done several of these videos where he uses Silly Putty to give extra mass to 
blades he's working on. And I'm long overdue for trying this. I've been dying to do this. Uh, it seems to do an excellent, excellent job of absorbing the shock so there's less overshot and uh, issues with breaking the point once it starts to get thin. So we're going to take a page out of his book and give this a shot. If you haven't, haven't been over to his channel to see it, uh, I'll leave a link for you. Head on over. My bow recommends that about the time you start getting to a 5 to 1 ratio is a good time to try this method. Now Edbo has a huge amount of silly putty he's using. That's a one pound egg I came to find out with correspondence with him. You can get that for about 20, 25 bucks somewhere there on Amazon. I've also got this Thera putty. It comes in different stiffnesses, I guess, viscosities, whatever you would call that. This one's supposed to be a medium. Uh, I'm in the garage, so it's pretty cold and even stiffer than normal. This is six ounces for comparison. And uh, I just happen to have that for some therapy for my arm that I'm working on still. So just to let you know that there are alternatives. This is about six to ten bucks for this six ounce. So you would need three of these to be the full one pound. So I'm not going to use it today. I don't need it full of obsidian bits. So we're going to put it away and go a different direction. I wanted to try something a little more natural. And I was at the hobby store and spotted this terracotta. And again, I already gave... Marty the bird basically with using a hardware dowel so psh, I'm not going to listen to anything that Edbo has to say on this about clay I guess either so no offense guys but I'm going to take a go here with some terracotta clay uh, it was super cheap it was like 10 bucks for this whole package should last a good long time uh, it does get all over your fingers but we're going to adjust here Try out the new moose shaft punch and throw this clay on there to see if we can keep from shattering this thing as it's starting to get thin. Might as well just use our new soft hammer too while we're at it as a as a percussor. I really need to get used to the weight of it. Clearly overdriving already trying to hit too hard with it. But so far the it's producing good results. Now where this gets interesting, this method of using this clay, right there I'm hitting on the tip to the base, but what I find has been most useful for using the clay or silly putty method is when you start to need to thin the base and you've already got a bit of a tip going. Everybody knows what happens when you hit on the base. You're just going to blow that tip right off. But using the clay, if you give it a little bit of a wrap around the tip and hold that back into your hand, um, it seems to do an excellent job of keeping that tip intact. So far I haven't had any tips go flying on me uh, while striking at the base and using the clay anyway. Maybe, maybe I'm just lucky and I just haven't used it in enough situations yet. Uh, eventually that'll probably happen, but so far it seems like a, an excellent, excellent way to control your tips and keep them from being removed. I'm going to pull out the moose antler, give it a little clinch here. And pretty much as I expected, uh, it wants to send flakes driving in. Part of it is I'm not used to it yet. It's got a little bit of a twist in it, so it points forward. I'm not holding it quite how it wants to be naturally held. Uh, but those adjustments will all be made in time. And I'm not getting bad results here. Our new pressure flaker also performs very, very well. I'm very pleased with that. What's interesting to me too is you'll see on the surface here and there, 
how much of that clay sticks to the to the material. I, I mean, I don't know why I'm surprised by that. It's just intriguing. Pull out the beaver tooth and start putting in a few notches here. Things are coming along nicely. Now, one thing, when you use bison horn and you wear the tip out eventually, don't just toss that horn. You can certainly splinter it up into these types of, of toothpicks. I don't know what else to call them, but they make excellent, excellent notching tools. I tend to use them mostly when I've stalled a notch, although they are thin uh, at different parts of the horn, so they're nice to be able to get deep, thin notches as well. But I like to get them to refresh a stalled notch. You can get into the corners and pop a flake loose. Now here you see I start to pick up on using the clay by wrapping it around the, the back edge and it adds excellent, excellent support when you're on a thin piece and surprisingly still lets the flake travel in and under the clay. It doesn't terminate there like a lot of times when you're using your hand if you get a little too much pressure the flake will terminate there. I find I get a lot of really good edge to edge results using that clay on the back edge. my fingers are by no stretch bony so I don't know why I get so many overshots that blow that far edge off but using this I seem to get much much better support I think the support gets spread more evenly across the back edge and fills in all the nooks and crannies in my fingers and the full edge is covered it allows it to to absorb the shock rather than letting it dive or giving it a chance to dive and take that edge I don't know, I'm rambling, I'm making stuff up, but so far the results have been good with that. The camera shifted and I didn't notice and so everything went fuzzy. I didn't get a good closing shot here of the point itself but it's come out about 6.35 mil thick. We're at about 45 and a half mil wide it looks like. So you know we're, we're 7 to 1 at least. And then just some final touch-ups with the, the moose pressure flaker again. Again note all the red clay stuck to the surfaces. Anyway I hope somebody finds that interesting. I look forward to using all of these tools in the coming year.